Chapter 15, Oliver's Secret. If an angel, let him be accursed. End of quote. One of the great mysteries of the history of Mormonism has to do with the vision behind the veil received by Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd, 1836. On that day, Joseph and Oliver entered into the most holy place in the Kirtland Temple, behind the veil at the west end of the main assembly floor of the Kirtland Temple. After having a vision visitation from Jesus Christ and three ministering angels, it appears as if Joseph and Oliver emerged from behind the veil, walked right past the priesthood brethren who were having a meeting on the other side of the veil, and proceeded to ascend the staircase to the third floor of the temple, where they had Oliver Cowdery's brother, who was acting as one of Joseph's scribes, write down the account of what had taken place. After closing the historical journal in which the account was written, it appears as if all three of these people never publicly mentioned what had taken place that day. I am unaware of any credible church historians who have ever proffered an explanation as to why this event was kept secret. I am going to suggest that the following things took place relative to that event. 1. A cursing was pronounced on the saints. 2. The secret ushering in of the ancient preparatory gospel of Abraham took place, even the Old Testament covenant God made with people prior to the gospel dispensation, ushered in during the meridian of time, when the New Testament Church of Christ was established. 3. A sin of treachery, mentioned in Malachi, was committed by Joseph Smith against Emma Smith, the wife of his youth. For years I have made statements on my blog implying that section 110 contains a mysterious and ominous message of doom involving a curse, even though the Lord informs Joseph and Oliver that, quote, Your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have, with their might, built this house to my name. For behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. And that's in section 110. While it is certainly good news that their sins are forgiven, it's also curious news. Why? Because three years earlier in section 88, the Lord had already announced that their sins had been forgiven. In that revelation, the Lord told Joseph, Oliver, and others that their names had been recorded in the book of the sanctified, that they are receiving another comforter, which is the promise of eternal life. Quote, Behold, this is pleasing unto your Lord, and the angels rejoice over you. The alms of your prayers have come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, and are recorded in the book of the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. Wherefore, I now send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your hearts, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same that I promised unto my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. End of quote. Clearly, Joseph and Oliver had been forgiven of their sins back at the time of section 88. The forgiveness of Joseph and Oliver's sins was yesterday's news. Why was it being announced again behind the veil in 1836 as something they should now rejoice in, as if the remission of their sins was something that had just taken place? I think the obvious answer is that they had sinned sometime after their names had been enrolled in the Book of the Sanctified. My contention that Joseph had sinned after being made clean is backed up by several revelations. One of these is section 93 given on May 6th of 1833. Quote, and now verily I say unto Joseph Smith, Jr., you have not kept the commandments, and must needs stand rebuked before the Lord. End of quote. Another is contained in a revelation Joseph received on December 5th of 1834. Quote, Verily condemnation resteth upon you who are appointed to lead my church, and to be saviors of men, and also upon the church. And there must needs be a repentance and a reformation among you in all things. End of quote. Clearly, Joseph, Oliver, and the whole church had fallen into a condemned state once the church had collectively broken the covenant of consecration. However, before that condemnation took place at the end of the three and a half year period of nurturing that the fullness had been on the earth, Joseph and others of his brethren apparently had their names enrolled into the book of the sanctified. The fact that the Lord is now declaring that Joseph and Oliver's sins are forgiven is promising, but it begs the question, what was the problem? What were the primary sins that caused them to stumble after being sanctified? And why were they being forgiven at that time behind the veil? 
Regarding sins that Joseph and Oliver might have become entangled in prior to their veil experience, there is some historical evidence to suggest that there was some type of sin in which Joseph Smith had been involved. He may have had an affair with a gal named Fanny Alger, although he apparently felt he was justified according to the laws of God. We're on this later. Another observation is that the saints had been promised that all of their pure in heart would, quote, see the face of God, end of quote, and they were anticipating the endowment of, quote, power from on high, end of quote. All of this was to take place in the solemn assembly, just days before Joseph and Oliver's visitation behind the veil. According to the journals and diaries regarding the solemn assembly, it's doubtful that any kind of endowment of power from on high took place as a group event. If individuals had such an experience, it was not recorded nor were any fruits of such an endowment forthcoming following the solemn assembly. In short, the great endowment of power that would enable to last great missionary endeavor to begin failed to happen, leaving many leaders of the church devastated and disappointed. Furthermore, the saints were anticipating the, quote, dispensation of the fullness of times, end of quote, to be ushered in during this time, and yet, the dispensation that is secretly ushered in behind the veil was quite a different dispensation. It was referred to in section 110 as the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, a phrase that never shows up in any other place in the scriptures. Quote, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and our seed all generations after us should be blessed. End of quote. Joseph and Oliver commanded to keep section 110 secret. It seems strange that God would usher in an ancient dispensation and command Joseph and Oliver to not reveal it publicly. They were to only document it in a journal for the saints to discover after the martyrdom. Brigham Young and his brethren must have been shocked and confused to find this secret revelation, containing a brief summary of what took place behind the veil in the journal, which they took with them to Utah. They must have been baffled at the fact that an ancient dispensation had been restored to the earth, and yet... The Lord apparently didn't want the church membership to know about it during the Kirtland and Nauvoo eras. It is really difficult to find any official, authoritative, and detailed statements from the modern church leaders explaining and clarifying just exactly what the Gospel of Abraham even is, let alone a documented reason why it needed to be restored to the earth in 1836 in secret. Many LDS manuals and publications insinuate that, as part of the dispensation of the fullness of times, all previous dispensations needed to be restored and gathered into it. On a BYU website, author Joel A. Flake states, quote, On April 3, 1836, the keys of the dispensation of the Gospel of Abraham were committed to the Prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple as part of the restoration of all things in the dispensation of the fullness of times, end of quote. The problem with this teaching is that the dispensation of the fullness of times had not yet been restored in 1836. Several years after the vision behind the veil in 1836, while incarcerated in jail in 1842, Joseph Smith would acknowledge that the dispensation of the fullness of times was, at that time, just beginning to usher in. Quote, For it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now beginning to usher in, that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glory should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. End of quote. In the above passage, Joseph was acknowledging that the dispensation of the fullness of times had not been ushered in yet. It was just beginning to be ushered in six years after section 110. He was speaking about things that needed to be revealed in the future, not about things that had been revealed and ushered in in the past. Clearly, the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham was not being ushered in as part of the, quote, restoration of all things in the dispensation of the fullness of times, end of quote, because the fullness of times had not begun. Previously, I provided historical and scriptural documentation to show that the dispensation of the fullness of times which Joseph in 1842 was still attempting to introduce was never ushered in. I can think of two possible reasons why the general authorities of the church typically remain quiet regarding the true meaning of the term, quote, gospel of Abraham, end of quote, in section 110. One would be that they don't know what the gospel of Abraham is, why it was ushered in, and what section 110 is speaking about. The other possibility is that they do. Sadly, the dispensation of the fullness of times was never ushered in during Joseph's lifetime. Instead, the saints were downgraded to an ancient dispensation and lesser gospel, 
that might be characterized as the preparatory gospel. Isaiah speaks prophetically about the restoration of the gospel of Abraham in Isaiah 48 and declares that the apostate saints of the latter days are suddenly given the declaration of former things because they are obstinate. He then reveals that the Lord will defer his anger in the latter days just as he did anciently when Israel rejected the law. Quote, for my name's sake will I defer my anger, and for my praise will I refrain from thee, that I cut thee not off. End of quote. That's Isaiah 48. The deferring of God's anger through an intercessory act is another rabbit hole and another secret historical topic that's intricately interrelated with the topic which will be discussed again in more detail at another time. Suffice it to say, judgments began to go forth at this time in the history of the church, but were mysteriously stopped. The dispensation of the fullness of times had been predicated on the restoration of the fullness of the priesthood, which had been lost, and the completion of the Nauvoo Temple by the appointed time. The Significance of a Suddenly Intervention Isaiah declares the word of the Lord thusly. I declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, I did them suddenly. The definition of suddenly, according to Webster's Dictionary, is, in an unexpected manner, unexpectedly, hastily, without preparation. The prophetic use of the term suddenly, when referring to a communication from the Lord, virtually always has to do with actions he takes when his people are in apostasy, and they need some kind of intervention or chastisement. If you do a keyword search on the word suddenly in the four standard works, you'll see an amazing pattern to support this supposition, such as when the Lord spoke suddenly to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to chastise Aaron and Miriam. Another example is when the Lord appeared suddenly to Paul on the way to Damascus to chastise him for persecuting the saints. A third example is given in Deuteronomy, when the Lord warns those who intermarry with the heathen that he will destroy them suddenly. In addition, Jeremiah tells us that at the time of the Lord's vengeance, Babylon will fall suddenly. A curse takes place at the temple when the Lord comes suddenly. In modern revelation, it was prophesied that the Lord would come suddenly to his temple with a curse to judgment upon all the nations that forget God and upon all the ungodly among you. Speaking to the saints, quote, Hearken, O you people of my church, saith the Lord your God, and hear the word of the Lord concerning you. The Lord who shall suddenly come to his temple, the Lord who shall come down upon the world with a curse to judgment, yea, upon all the nations that forget God, and upon all the ungodly among you. End of quote. That's in section 133. I believe the above prophecy in section 133 is referring to the Kirtland Temple, and that it applies to what took place as documented in section 110. Keep in mind, however, that virtually all prophecies have a dual fulfillment. All of the above passages support a reoccurring theme. The Lord acts suddenly when there's an intervention or a chastisement, or something new needs to take place, usually as a result of the apostasy of an obstinate person or people. The Ark of the Covenant in the Kirtland Temple Another key to interpreting the message of warning of doom and doom carefully implied in the sudden appearance of Christ and three ministering angels to Joseph and Oliver has to do with the following observation, quote, We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold, in color like amber. End of quote. A keyword search using paved work reveals the Lord was apparently standing on or above the Ark of the Covenant and fulfilling the enactment of ancient sayings and statutes pertaining to the Ark. Uh, see Exodus 25. This and other related passages lead to the Atonement Statute in Leviticus 16, which supports the previously mentioned intercessory actions of God's servants, who delay the wrath of God by taking the sins of Latter-day Israel upon themselves. The Future Fame of the Kirtland Temple the following passages in section 110 are speaking about the future fame of the Kirtland Temple. Quote, Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out, and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. And the fame of this house shall spread to foreign lands, and this is the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people. Even so, Amen. 
The above declaration in section 110 is speaking about fame, which spreads to foreign lands. Although there are a few members of the church scattered throughout the world who have a cursory understanding about the past and future significance of the Kirtland Temple, society in general and people in foreign lands have no idea that the Kirtland Temple exists or that it is significant in any way. In the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, it informs us that fame has to do with, quote, a public report or rumor, end of quote, not just an event that's inside knowledge to a certain religious group. It has to do with a, quote, favorable report, end of quote. It has to do with a, quote, report of good or great actions, a report that exalts the character's celebrity renown, end of quote. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary uses the, quote, fame of Solomon, end of quote, as an example, as well as the fame of Jesus. Fame is to make famous. The Kirtland Temple is not currently famous in foreign lands to a great number of people, but it will be in the near future. Those who understand the doctrine of the three watches and the promises pertaining to future events that will take place in the Kirtland Temple understand that the Kirtland Temple is going to become famous in foreign lands in the near future. When the marvelous work begins, and the dispensation of the fullness of times is ushered in. I began speaking about this secret event by stating that Joseph and Oliver share a grand secret with each other. That secret was the experience they both had behind the veil in the Kirtland Temple when they experienced what's documented in section 110. God apparently commanded them to not publicly reveal it to the saints. Oliver's Secret I believe that Oliver had a secret, all of his own, that was revealed to him as a result of two things. One was a vision that he had prior to the event that is documented in section 110. The other has to do with something that was revealed to him as a direct result of the event that's documented in section 110. Oliver could see something about Joseph that Joseph could not see about himself. Joseph's eyes were covered. The Book of Mormon profoundly modifies a passage in Isaiah to reveal that the Latter-day Seers, Joseph and Sidney, would have their eyes covered because of the sins of the Latter-day Saints. Quote, for behold, the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. For behold, ye have closed your eyes, and ye have rejected the prophets and your rulers, and the seers hath he covered because of your iniquity. End of quote. Joseph the seer had his eyes covered because of the sins of the Latter-day Saints. It was because they took the scriptures lightly and failed to live the law of the gospel, which includes that law of consecration. This is why Oliver could see something about Joseph, and Joseph could not see about himself. Shortly after the visitation in the Curtain and Temple, Oliver became very critical of something Joseph had done. On the surface, it seems totally bizarre that Oliver would become a militant accuser of Joseph Smith in light of everything that had happened and all they had experienced and been through together. Oliver accused Joseph of committing a grievous moral sin. Joseph denied he had sinned. Oliver described it as a, quote, dirty, nasty, filthy affair, end of quote. Interestingly, Joseph did not deny having had a relationship with Fanny Alger. He denied that he had committed adultery with her, implying that he had married her, and therefore the act was not adultery. According to Bushman, quote, Joseph never denied a relationship with Alger, but instead it was not adulterous. He wanted it on record that he never confessed to such a sin. Presumably, he felt innocent because he had married Alger. End of quote. Oliver has a vision of Joseph's future. Joseph believed that what he was doing he had been commanded of God through an angel, and that by marrying polygamous, polygamous wives he was not committing adultery. Shortly before the vision behind the veil, Oliver Cowdery wanted to understand more about the mission of Joseph Smith. So he gave Joseph a patriarchal blessing that came in the form of a prophetic vision. Interestingly, this patriarchal blessing slash vision was received on September 22, 1835. Moroni had previously appeared to Joseph Smith on this exact date for six years in a row. In the patriarchal blessing, it was revealed to Oliver that Joseph would return from the dead to lead Israel into the land of Zion in the literal fulfillment of the parable of the redemption of Zion, and that Oliver would be by Joseph's side fulfilling his own prophetic calling, quote, For like Joseph of old shall he be. He shall save the just from the desolation by the wise counsel of the Almighty. For by his direction shall they gather into storehouses and barns, till they overflow with the richness of the fruit of the harvest. And by this means shall the just be saved from famine, while the nations of the wicked are distressed and faint. 
In due time shall he go forth toward the north, and by the power of his word shall the deep begin to give way, and the ice melt before the sun. By the keys of the kingdom shall he lead Israel into the land of Zion, while the house of Jacob shouts in the dance and in the song. Joy, O my soul, in that day, or thou shalt be with him and bear thy part in the keys which are confirmed upon thee for an everlasting priesthood forever and ever. End of quote. Quote, his fame shall be sounded in foreign lands, even to the ends of the earth, as well as nigh at home. For in this the times shall change. A prophet shall have honor in his own country. He shall sit in the great assembly and general council of patriarchs, and execute the will and commandment under the Ancient of Days. For he shall have his place and act in his station. End of quote. Joseph wrestles with an angel. Quote. Oh, sorry, not a quote. Despite the Oliver's visions giving a glowing report of Joseph's future conquest and successful completion of his responsibilities in restoring and gathering Israel, his amazing prophetic vision curiously begins by revealing that Joseph would need to, quote, overcome and, quote, prevail, end of quote, over something in the future. Joseph would yet prevail after wrestling with an angel. It was revealed to Oliver that God would need to sustain Joseph during a future time. Notice the use of these descriptives in the opening passages of the blessing. Quote, Blessed of the Lord is my brother, for the integrity of his heart and the steadfastness of his soul. Upheld by the arm of the Almighty, he shall never fall, but shall be strengthened by his right hand till he overcomes. Like Jacob of old, he shall wrestle with the angel, and as a prince shall he have power with God and shall prevail. Ever faithful to his friends and true to his word, the goodness of the Most High shall sustain him, and thousands shall stand up to defend him from the hand of his enemies and put forth the hand and ward off the blow where were it needful. But ere his foes are aware, he shall be hid under the pavilion of the Lord Jehovah. The, end of quote. the concept of being hid under the pavilion of the Lord is consistent with the Old Testament prophecy in 2 Samuel 7 that explains that the mercy of God would not depart from Joseph, despite his transgression and the associated chastisement he would receive. This amazing vision was acknowledged that despite the fact that Joseph had had his name enrolled in the Book of the Sanctified several years earlier, he was in transgression. He still needed to prevail and overcome in a struggle with an angel. The fact that Joseph would not ultimately fall and lose his salvation, but would nevertheless need to be eventually overcome and prevail over some kind of a stumbling block associated with an angel, appears to be one of the grand secrets that Oliver knew about in conjunction with his experience behind the veil. Oliver had seen in vision that Joseph would wrestle with a dark angel, perhaps the one that commanded him to depart from the law of the gospel in section 42 by commanding him to have multiple wives and eventually prevail, overcome, and repent. He saw this in September of 1835, shortly before the veil experience documented in section 110. He was also very possibly new about the first visit of the angel in Joseph's life and possibly even the affair with Fanny before Joseph and Oliver knelt down behind the veil in the Kirtland Temple. Historians cannot agree on when Joseph's involvement with Fanny began and ended. Most credible researchers, including Bushman, believe that Joseph's intimate involvement with Fanny Alger took place sometime after mid-1835. It appears to me that prior to mid-1835 is very unlikely based on the prophetic narratives orchestrating the events of his ministry. This makes perfect sense according to the information being presented here, and based on the fact that both the Kirtland Saints and the Jackson Saints had failed to live consecration and had rejected the fullness of the gospel, by the end of 1834. Regardless of whether the affair with Fanny took place before or after the Vale experience, there is very little solid evidence to suggest that Joseph Smith was involved with polygamy or any grievous sins prior to the rejection of the fullness of the, of the, the fullness by the Gentile Church and the church-wide condemnation taking place in December of 1834. Joseph claimed that an angel threatened his life. <clears throat> Quote, Joseph Smith told many people about an angel that commanded him to take plural wives, end of quote. According to one account, the angel visited Joseph on four occasions. The testimony of Mary Elizabeth Rollins state that the angel visited Joseph three separate times between 1834 and 1842, commanding him to take multiple wives. 
Other documentation suggests that Joseph delayed obeying the angel for a considerable number of years. Quote, an angel came to him, brackets, Joseph Smith, end of bracket, and the last time he came with a drawn sword in his hand and told Joseph if he did not go into the principal, he would slay him. Joseph said he talked to him soberly about it and told him it was an abomination and quoted scripture to him. He said in the Book of Mormon it was an abomination in the eyes of the Lord, and they were to adhere to these things except the Lord speak, bracket, the prophet reported that. The angel came to me three more times between the years of 1834 and 1842 and said I was to obey that principle or he would slay me. End of quote. Clearly, Joseph was not naive about the law of marital monogamy contained in the gospel he had been instrumental in bringing forth. The purpose of bringing forth the law of the gospel was to enable the saints to escape the power of the enemy and to prepare them to be endowed with power from on high. Quote, and that ye might escape the power of the enemy, and be gathered unto me a righteous people, without spot and blameless. Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment, that ye should go to the Ohio, and there I'll give unto you my law, and there ye shall be endowed with power from on high. End of quote. He knew full well that monogamy is part of the celestial marital protocol, according to the law contained in section 42. Quote, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. End of quote. A second witness to the truthfulness of this marital monogamy doctrine is found in section 49, and a third witness was canonized when Oliver's article on marriage was accepted by common consent and canonized in the DNC. As mentioned in the testimony of Leitner above, Joseph also had the unmistakable declarations of the Book of Mormon emblazoned upon his mind as well. Below are a few snippets from the Book of Mormon on this topic. Quote, and now it came to pass that the people of Nephi, under the reign of the second king, began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices, such as likened to David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. End of quote. Wherefore, my brethren, hear me, and hearken to the word of the Lord. For there shall not any man among you have save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me, saith the Lord of hosts. Wherefore this people shall keep my commandments, saith the Lord of hosts, or cursed be the land for their sakes. Parentheses. Oh, that's end of quote. Note that the Book of Mormon defines a chaste woman as someone who is married to a man that has only one wife. Further, it warns that the land is cursed when these commandments having to do with monogamy are violated. Hold this thought until we get to the curse upon the earth mentioned by Malachi and the curse mentioned by Isaiah. Quote, Behold the Lamanites your brethren whom ye hate because of their filthiness and the cursing which hath come upon their skins are more righteous than you, for they have not forgotten the commandment of the Lord which was given unto our father, that they should have save it were one wife, and concubines they should have none and there should not be whoredoms committed among them. And now, this commandment they observe to keep. Wherefore, because of this observance, in keeping this commandment, the Lord God will not destroy them, but will be merciful unto them, and one day they shall become a blessed people. Behold, their husbands love their wives, and their wives love their husbands, and their husbands and their wives love their children, and their unbelief and their hatred toward you is because of the iniquity of their fathers. Wherefore, how much better are you than they in the sight of your great creator? End of quote. And then, quote, And now it came to pass that Zenith conferred the kingdom upon Noah, one of his sons. Therefore Noah began to reign in his stead, and he did not walk in the ways of his father. For behold, he did not keep the commandments of God, but he did walk after the desires of his own heart. And he had many wives and concubines, and he did cause the people to commit sin and to do that which was abominable in the sight of the Lord. Yea, and they did commit whoredoms and all manner of wickedness, and he laid a tax of one-fifth part of all they possessed, a fifth part of their gold and of their silver, and a fifth part of their ziff, and their copper, and their brass, and their iron, and a fifth part of their fatlings, and also a fifth part of all their grain. And all this did he take to support himself, and his wives and concubines, and also his priests, and their wives, and their concubines. Thus he had changed the affairs of the kingdom. End of quote. And then, quote, Riplakish did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord, for he did have many wives and concubines. 
end of quote. A contrary commandment. According to the Book of Mormon, polygamy is a very serious practice, which is very seldom ever condoned by the Lord. I believe this is why Joseph wrestled with the angel over the commandment to take plural wives. It was blatantly contrary to the teachings of the Book of Mormon and the law of the gospel that had been brought forth through Joseph Smith. It's remarkable that an angel would command Joseph Smith to violate the commandments of God as given in the Book of Mormon, the New Testament, and the law of the gospel as revealed in sections 42 and 49. These conflicting doctrines on celestial marriage cannot both be true. It's amazing to me how many LDS men and women will pray and fast to know if the law of multiple wives in section 132 is true without first praying to get a testimony that the law of celestial monogamy in sections 42 and 49 is true. Once a person receives a testimony that monogamy is integral to God's law of marriage as documented in section 42, it's difficult to understand why one would even need to pray about the contradictory celestial law of marriage contained in section 132. Even if an angel commands it, such is dual-mindedness and denial of a previous revelation. Another Gospel One of the basic tenets of biblical Christianity is that a believer in Christ will be accursed if they depart from the faith and accept a different gospel than the one revealed in Holy Scripture, even if an angel from heaven should command it. One of the basic tenets of biblical Christianity is that a believer in Christ will be accursed if they depart from the faith and accept a different gospel than the one revealed in Holy Scripture, even if an angel from heaven should command it. Quote, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. End of quote. Joseph taught how to discern a false angel. Curiously, Joseph once warned that ministering angels of Satan appearing as angels of light had appeared to members of the church and his caution was that a false angel could be detected by the fact that they would contradict a former revelation. Quote, there have been also been ministering angels in the church which were of Satan appearing as an angel of light. A sister in the state of New York had a vision who said it was told her that as she would go to a certain place in the woods, an angel would appear to her. She went to the appointed time and saw a glorious personage descending arrayed in white. He commenced and told her to fear God and said that her husband was called to do great things, but that he must not go more than 100 miles from home or we, he would not return, whereas God had called him to go to the ends of the earth, and he has since been more than 1,000 miles from home and is yet alive. Many true things were spoken by his, this personage, and many things that were false. How it may be asked, was this known to be a bad angel? By his contradicting a former revelation. End of quote. <clears throat> the Old Testament confirms the above declaration that the word of the Lord takes precedence over conflicting commandments from angels. It tells a story of two prophets in 1 Kings 13. The first prophet had received instruction from the word of the Lord on how to proceed on his journey. A second prophet intervenes during the journey and informs the first prophet that he was visited by an angel. He informs the first prophet that the angel had given a new, different commandment to be given to the first prophet. Because the first prophet was willing to accept the testimony of another prophet and the contrary commandment supposedly from an angel over the word of God, he was destroyed by a lion. The fact that the angel with the drawn sword was giving Joseph a contradictory commandment is a poignant and sobering fact, given Joseph's above warning to the saints. Okay, on part two, it's going to be the curse is caused by breaking the everlasting covenant and by breaking the monogamous marital vow.